Okay. Can you hear me back there? Oh, this sounds like sort of it's getting, things are getting amplified. Can you hear from there? Can you hear? Do you want to hear? Okay, good. I mean, <laughs> the first question, do you really want to hear? The second question, do you hear well? <laughs> so, okay, I think that it's time or we are in we advance. Got a, we got a few more minutes. I mean, yes, I don't we can give this two minutes. Yeah, give everybody a chance to come. Okay, I think that we can start now. So, welcome everybody. So, today the first speaker is Bruno Ecker from the Felix University of Marburg. So, he will talk us about the individual and collective bacterial motions. Please, Bruno, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much to the organizers for giving me a chance to present here our work. And thanks for these last minute arrangements uh, because I was a little bit late in uh, um, registering. Um, what I would like to tell you about are some of the things that we've been doing in the past, um, in recent times. And uh, the, uh, um, the, my main interest is fluids. And in the case of fluids, there is sort of an, uh, a very active area, appropriately called active matter. And uh, there are various facets of it, um, including sort of the biological and the non-biological parts. And what I'm mainly interested in is through the connections with my biology friends in some biological questions. And uh, this is what this presentation then will be about. Um, there will be, well, um, if you look at sort of the life cycle and the different forms in which bacteria um, appear, then this is a cartoon of what you have. Uh, up there you have what is called sort of the planktonic lifestyle. And this is bacteria swimming uh, freely in liquids, typically water, uh, sometimes with um, more viscous stuff sort of around it. And they're swimming around freely. And from a statistical mechanics point of view, this is um, something like sort of an active gas. You have these particles that are moving and then what you would like to describe are sort of the statistical properties. Do they form liquids, like states? Do they form some kind of crystals? Do they um, have sort of denser phases? Uh, do they form rafts, that is, swim several of them in sort of a certain direction? And uh, so this up there is sort of the, the beauty of the, oh, this is very faint. OK, um, that's sort of the, the beauty of sort of this, um, statistical mechanics type situation. <clears throat> what is more interesting from the biology part, that's the boring part, is whatever happens near a surface. So you have these creatures coming down, attaching to a surface, forming small colonies, uh, gathering in those colonies, um, uh, sticking together, uh, excluding um, uh, certain polymers that um, um, hold them together, <coughs> forming what are then sort of first called microcolonies, and in the next step you have sort of these 
more packed regions here, um, the beginnings of biofilms. And uh, removing biofilms is one of the big issues uh, in all kinds of uh, medical contexts. And uh, then, you know, I mean, they can sort of, once there are enough of them, they can grow, they can form sort of these columns. And then on the top of the columns, they start swarming again because they've exploited essentially all the resources that they have there, and then things continue on from there. And um, this cycle um, sort of illustrates many of the facets um, of microbial life. And as I said, the part up there is sort of predominantly the statistical mechanics. And down here is where sort of plenty of interesting biology happens. Now, as also indicated in this cartoon, the types of bacteria I'm interested in <coughs> are the ones that have sort of these long appendages called flagellae. Um, these are very long filaments, typically several times the length of the cell long, very thin. And they use them to sort of move around. They use them to move around in the planktonic phase. But they also need them um, on the surface and to start forming biofilms. And as indicated in this case, um, they have. It's much better. All right, thank you. So now I have to play with two of them. Well, I'm safe. You're not so safe. <laughs> um, there was a talk where somebody was operating with a green laser uh, and sort of shining into the audience. And then the next step of that is if you have an experimental physicist who insists to really have a blue laser, that's when you should get worried. <laughs> OK, so we'll stick to the red one. So they have these appendices here <coughs> called the flagellae. And in the case that I've shown here, they have a single one. Uh, the case you're probably more familiar with is Escherichia coli, and they have lots of them. But it turns out that's rare. Having a single one is sort of uh, much more frequent. OK. So what I uh, would like to tell you about are sort of four aspects, and we'll see how time sort of goes. Um, the first one concerns the motion of individual cells, uh, where they use their uh, flagella in a very funny and uh, unsuspected kind of way. Um, the second one concerns uh, a phase where these bacteria form clusters, they grow and they expand, and then they spread more or less in a liquid phase on a surface. That's called swarming. And then the question is, what do they do and how do they organize? And then we're going to somewhat denser suspensions uh, where these bacteria set up vortical motions that are reminiscent of turbulence. Uh, it's a phase that has been called bacterial turbulence. And since most of this is 2D, uh, it raises an interesting fluid mechanics question uh, whether you can sort of get even larger uh, phases from that. And then, if time permits, um, the thing that you can do is you can sprinkle tracers in these suspensions. <coughs> and you can look at sort of the dynamics of those tracers. Now, you might say this is sort of, a, sort of a stochastic motion, and you should get some kind of diffusion. Well, diffusion, yes, but uh, it's uh, going to be anomalous. All right. So to set the stage, let me turn to the first case. And uh, these are the two papers in which the material has been uh, presented. And it's essentially, and initially, and very importantly, um, it's the work of Marco Kühn, who worked in the lab of Kai Thormann. And he observed this, actually, under the microscope. And then it was Felix Schmidt who set out to do the numerical simulations to, well, support the observations and to partially explain the observations. Um, so the first part is the phenomenon as such. And then the second part actually becomes interesting when you look into um, the molecular chemistry of these flagella. All right. So this is the main actor in their experiments. It's called Chevanella. It's a bacterium that lives in the soil, in marine um, sediments. Uh, it lives off metals that it finds there. And uh, typically, it has one flagellum at the pole, and it has one off the side. And the one off the side is a nuisance, so you talk to your biologists, and they know how to get rid of it. So this is how you get it down to one flagellum. 
And then one flagellum, the polar one, um, has a motor, as is often the case, that can turn sort of both ways. The other thing that is important and that is somewhat different from the more familiar case of E. coli is because it has a single flagellum, it would like to be able to move forward and backward. Now, in order to do that, you need a helix, a flagellum, that has a helix of a fixed sense of orientation. Think of a core screw type motion. If you rotate it one way, you're moving one way. And if you rotate it the other way, you're moving the other way. But that works only if sort of the orientation of that helix is fixed. So you need a structure where there is sort of a built-in, mechanically imposed kind of helix in the structure. And then uh, turning the motor can allow you to move forward and backward. Now, as I said, this creature lives in sort of marine sediments. And this is a, a somewhat obstructed environment. This is, a, let's say, a cartoon of it. Uh, you have all kinds of grains and smaller grains. And then there is a little bit of liquid area. And this is where they move about. And as is sort of indicated up there, every now and then they can get stuck which they, of course, don't like, so they would like to get out. Now, the simplest version of trying to get out is to back up. So you reverse your motor, and then you hope you're getting out again. OK. And uh, now, we didn't sort of set up a marine sediment, but something that, um, to some extent, is similar to it. Um, so you have these two glass plates. You have agarose, which has a rough surface. And then there is sort of a little bit of liquid between the agarose and the upper glass plate. That's where they're swimming, and then you can follow them. And you look down with the microscope. <clears throat> and in order to see something with the microscope, what you do is you um, put some fluorescent dye on the flagellum. So what you see is the flagellum. You don't see the cell body. And this little movie that will appear here uh, in a minute shows the following sequence of events. So the cell starts where somewhere here. And you're not seeing the body, but you're seeing sort of the flagellum. It moves up there. This is when it gets stuck. And then it does something funny and backs out again. OK? Whoops. So here it starts, swims to the right. This is when it gets stuck, wiggles the tail, wraps the flagellum around the cell body, and backs out. And of course, when Marco first saw this, he couldn't believe it, because that was not documented. That was not supposed to be happening. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, this movie runs sort of repeatedly, but he has many observations of it. So this is what they actually do. And there is some instability that takes the flagellum, wraps it around the cell body, and then they back out. How do you know it's around the cell body and not just around the cell? Because the cell body is there. So if you have other visualization techniques, you can sort of see where the body is, and it wraps it around the body. All right. Um, now, that, of course, sort of smells like something that you should be able to compute, because there are established models for these things. So you take the cell body, you take the flagellum, and um, then you discretize it with um, lots of mechanical um, elements. And you can introduce uh, <coughs> springs that keep the distance. And you can uh, introduce springs that keep a certain torsion so that you get the flagellum. And you can do other springs to give you uh, the pitch of that um, helix. Um, and then you can apply a force at the body um, of the cell, where sort of the, the cell surface is. And then you can let this thing evolve. Um, these models have been developed by Holger Stark and friends. Um, and these little arrows here uh, give you a sense of orientation of this. So it's not, I mean, you're rotating here, and you're rotating this around the flagellum body. And um, <coughs> well, so that's the initial state. There is a cell body up there. And that's sort of the flagellum uh, in the helical state for forward motion. 
And then you start by reversing the motor. And then that's what happens. And you can sort of see, we'll amplify this in a moment, that uh, you're sort of undoing that first screw. And then uh, it sort of goes sideways. And then it starts wrapping around the cell body and pulls it in until it's sort of completely there. And of course, what you can also do is you can reverse the direction, and then it will unwrap again. Um, so you have this clockwise motion for the forward uh, motion, and then you go sort of reverse. And then what happens is that this flips sideways and sort of starts pulling it down. And if you uh, look at sort of the images that we had, uh, so here you see then that it's initially in the long form, and then it goes a bit sideways, uh, pulls it down. So this would be comparable to that. And then it actually starts wrapping around. And sort of this nicely fits to the cell body. So there is, um, in a sense, a mechanical instability close to the cell body where the flagellum flips sideways and pulls in. Now, <clears throat> um, in these cases of a bacterium with a single flagellum, um, that has been analyzed uh, before. And um, the, the typical structure of a flagellum is that you have the helix at some point, and then you need a flexible hook region uh, close to the cell body, which transforms sort of the momentum that the motor applies to the helix, uh, and at the same point has sort of a little flexibility that you can bend sideways. Now, if you're um, pulling backwards, then naturally the cell sort of has the higher friction, the, the helix goes backwards, and then you're stretching this region. And if you then reverse, trying to go forward again, then you're compressing this. And this has all the ingredients you need for a buckling instability. So you have a, a flexible element, which you're first stretching. That's fine. But then when you're compressing, it's likely to sort of go sideways. So this is what was described as a reverse and flick type mechanism. And this is the way that these, flagella, these bacteria with a single flagellum change direction, I mean, in their motion, not only forward and backward, but also sideways. So they're swimming along happily in a certain direction. Then they back up a little bit. And the moment they start pushing forward again, you get this instability. And then your cell moves in a different direction. So this is, was known, and this is very important for them. What happens in this case <coughs> is, uh, somewhat different, that if you now apply this uh, tension, then what you see is that this wavelength here gets somewhat extended. And therefore, this mechanical structure, this, this, this first loop in the helix, um, gets sort of a little bit overstretched. And this overstretching makes it switch sideways um, and then uh, starts forming what? And this is how it sort of bends off. It doesn't sort of induce this uh, uh, flick instability here at the hook, but it sort of goes sideways and starts wrapping around. And if you now look at sort of the, the possible motions, and this is why I said this was sort of a third way of uh, flagellum type motions, um, there is the case of E. coli, which happily swims in one direction with all the flagella in a bundle. Then it uh, reverses a few of them. And then it begins to look like sort of crosshairs there are in all possible directions. And then it reverses again and starts swimming in a different direction. This was this run and tumble phase that Howard Burke for decades analyzed. And this was sort of the standard motion. Then we have this reverse and flick, where you sort of swim forward. And then when you back up, uh, you get sort of a jump. And then this is sort of the latest version, where you actually wrap the flagellum around the cell body um, to get sort of stronger forces and to be able to escape from a trap. Now, 
If you look a little bit closer into the architecture of the flagellum, uh, I mentioned that there was sort of this hook region, there is this motor, there is the hook region, and then there's the flagellum up there. And what all these funny symbols here mean is that the microbiologists and the biochemists have done great work uh, trying to figure out which proteins are where and what do they do. And so there are all kinds of motor proteins, and then there are various FLG, uh, the flagellum proteins, and then there is an E, and then there are sort of others uh, that sort of go out there. So the flagellum is composed out of a number of different flagellins. Um, and the tail, the main body, typically was expected to be of a single one. But it turns out that many cells have several of these flagella, uh, flagellins, of these proteins. And the question is, what do they do with them? What's the purpose of having all of these different flagellin, flagellins to work with? Now, in, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is a really great cartoon. It kind of shows how the flagellum is uh, put together mechanically. So you have this cylindrical structure. Somewhere down here, you have the cell body. And the way the, flagellins, the flagellum is built up is that you transport these proteins through this inner part of the channel. And when they reach at the top, you have this construction site there. And then they're sort of added on top of it. And it's a fascinating problem how the flagellins, the proteins, get from the cell body up there. And so this is how it is built. Um, and um, this is some more biochemistry. Um, there is a central part. This is this D-knot part. This is where they all are sort of stuck together. And then there are other parts which are flexible. They can be long, complicated, or very short. And this is how these different flagellins differ. They have a common part so that they can all be stacked. And then there are different appendages up there. Now, in the case of our uh, uh, pet creature, um, it is known that it has two of them. And what is also can be seen from the um, analyzing the microscope images is that they're not randomly distributed, but what you have is you have a composition of one type close to the cell body. This must be the other way around. So this is the one close to the cell body. This is the cell body. And then there is the rest of the flagellin. And uh, this is one where you have a little bit of A and most of it B. There you have more A and only a little bit of B, different types A and B. And then um, it's sort of clear from a physicist's point of view, if you have this flagellum composed of different elements, the mechanical properties change as you go along. And what this uh, simulation on the right-hand side shows is the ability, yeah, is the ability of these different um, flagellae to form the screw. And so here, the blue part is where the screw formation occurs. And what you notice is that if you have only this part A here, then um, it's a very <coughs> flexible uh, kind of flagellum. The first part, with a little bit of uh, motor torque, you immediately start forming a screw. Now, that's too easy, because you would like to sort of get as much forward propulsion as you can. So you would like to happen this rather late. So you start adding in um, this second uh, part. And then you see that you form sort of an optimal here around 20 or so percent. And then there is another one when this happens sort of more quickly. But if you go to a flagellum that is only composed of B, it never, ever forms the screw. So if they get stuck, they're really stuck. <coughs> and so if you look at this, then it's clear that there are sort of regions where it's more favorable for, um, to compose your flagellum. And that's what you actually see. This is the portion. Uh, an experiment where you extract this, and you see that sort of in the range of about 20%, where you have sort of this optimum mixture um, of this second flagellum to give you a flagellum that is um, useful for forward and backward propagation, but with a little bit of addition on torque, you can actually form the screw and get out of it. So in the course of evolution, bacteria have figured out that A, it's useful, and B, ways of actually doing it. OK. Um, 
The second topic that I wanted to um, address is what happens if you have um, several um, of these bacteria uh, swarming on an agar plate. And this is work that is essentially done in the lab of Knut Trescher. And the hero of this is Hannah Jekyll, because she's the one who collected all the data, did an uh, incredible amount of data analysis, and um, sort of is behind the movies that I'll be showing in a moment. The experiment is relatively simple. Uh, it runs for about 10 to 15 hours. You take your agar plate, which in this case is about 9 centimeters wide. You put a little droplet of bacteria in the middle, and then you let them grow. And then you form sort of a more or less circular patch that sort of spreads out. And now what you do is, um, during those 10 hours, you have this camera, and you move it from the center to the side until you hit the empty plate, and then backwards to the other side. And then you start making movies, lots of tiny movies. And this is what's indicated by these squares here. So what you get is you get a spatial and temporally resolved images of what's happening in this uh, while this, these bacteria are growing and spreading. Um, at the end of the day, and it takes about a day, you have about a terabyte of data. And <coughs> the first part that you can get out of this data, which is something that I still find uh, uh, somewhat puzzling, if you look at the overall growth rate of this, then you see that the swarming area grows with about the doubling time, more or less in parallel, um, which indicates that it's essentially driven by the growth of the bacteria. Now, this does not mean that the thing stays homogeneous. And that was sort of the fascinating observation of this. If you look at the movies that you collect in the course of time, um, these are some snapshots. This is about 20, so they're about 100 by 100 microns. And if you do this over 9 centimeter, you begin to realize that you're actually collecting lots of movies. Uh, <coughs> so that's what you see. Now, this is the part that is relatively easy. There are so many of them that they're dense and that they're packed and that they're um, sort of more in a biofilm <coughs> phase. The part up there is also um, relatively simple. Um, you have them sort of freely moving around. Uh, but then here you have all kinds of interactions. You have rafts that sort of, of uh, groups of bacteria that move in a certain direction. And here you have some that are stuck that are in the process of forming biofilms, but others sort of move about. And now what you can do is you can sort of take all this data and um, extract uh, properties. So you take these movies, you collect something like cell velocities, you also collect the cells, the, the aspect ratios, the diameters, the length, and everything. And then you group them according to whether they're motile or not. Uh, you take the rafts, you calculate the velocities of the rafts, and um, then um, you look at this as a function of time and of position in this biofilm. And this is uh, uh, some set of data. This is for the cell density, the cell speed, the fraction of these clusters, and the fraction of motile rafts. And um, then you do data analysis. Now, I've shown you sort of a few of these properties, uh, but this is a selection of even more aspect ratio, speed, biomass density, enclosed density, and so forth. And uh, this is sort of the... Uh, an indicator of what these values are. And then the question is, can you organize this mess? And we've had some presentations about machine learning tools. And so what you do is you crank uh, the machinery on all of this data, and then you get sort of two main components in which you can lay it out. And what you then find is that you can group this in essentially uh, five different groups and phases. Uh, sort of the green, the yellow, the red, the blue, and the purple ones. And these are pictures from the experiment and from the simulations below. And uh, this is collected here again. So you have these uh, different phases 
that you can identify. And then the interesting part is that you not only can identify these phases, but you can also look where they appear in the biofilm as it's sort of, uh, no, in the, not the biofilm, in this uh, swarming community. And then what you see is that the blue part, which corresponds to the biofilm, that's pretty much happening in the center. Then you have the yellow phase. That's this one here. That's the rafting part. That sort of happens towards the periphery. And then the single uh, phase ones you have here, and then all the way at the end, sort of where the density and everything, where there is enough room, um, then you have a, a thin layer of isolated cells that swims freely. And then you have sort of these two uh, intermediate phases where you have single cells and rafts, and where you have rafts and biofilms. And that sort of nicely goes across um, the biofilm. And then um, you can make a little mechanical model that takes the interactions between these cells into account. And you can adjust parameters. And then you can get sort of the simulation equivalent of the pictures that I showed earlier. That's the single cell phase. That's the rafting phase. And you see that you really form these groups that move uh, in parallel. And then there is the biofilm phase, where there is very little movement. Um, these are simulations done by Jörn Dunkel and his group. OK. So now we're moving to sort of collective um, phenomena and motions of these cells. And <clears throat> um, the question that we then began to address uh, is, um, what can we say about the hydrodynamics of these? And this is uh, a paper that just appeared in PRL, and there is a follow-up with some more detail, which has not yet appeared in PRE, but it's available on the archive. So the observation uh, starts out with something like this. Um, you have um, biofilm. In this case, I think it's, again, Bacillus subtilis, as was in the previous case. Uh, come on. Let me run this again. And what you see is that uh, it begins to look like there are sort of jets and vortices in this kind of structure. And the part that is fascinating about this is that the organism itself is on the order of microns. But the structures that you see here are on the order of hundreds of microns. So it's a collective effect. Several of them sort of go together, and they set up these larger scale motions. And most of these films are 2D. Now, if you look at sort of the thermodynamics, the hydrodynamics of two-dimensional flows, uh, you learn that there is a difference between even and odd dimensions. In three dimensions, we have the standard picture that uh, Paolo told us yesterday. You start out with uh, large-scale motions, which you drive. And then you form smaller and smaller vortices until you get down to the viscous scale, and then things are dissipated. In even dimensions, there is a conservation law, which is related to the helicity. And that um, gives you an inverse process. It's not that vorticity and vortices break up into smaller ones, but it's an inverse process where vortices group together to form ever larger ones, until ultimately you have something that's on the size of the system. And so the question is, if you have these two-dimensional things, if these bacteria can manage to get you structures that go from the size of the bacterium to the order of hundreds of microns, well, can you actually push a little bit harder and get something that triggers this inverse cascade. So this is um, the question um, paraphrased in the standard representation. That's the energy density versus wave number. This is what you happen in typical three-dimensional turbulence. You're feeding on the large scales, which is small wave number. And then this energy gets transported down by this energy dissipation rate until you reach the viscous scale, and then the energy is taken out. Now, in 2D, you can have another process. This is the scale where you drive. And then rather than being dissipated to, at larger k, there is a bit of energy that gets transported <coughs> to smaller k until it hits the size of the domain. It cannot go to larger scales anymore. Um, then it starts accumulating and growing. And then you build up sort of a big amplitude in this um, 
lowest um, wave number um, uh, structure. And this is very much reminiscent, and there are ways of actually doing this almost one by one, to the formation of a condensate in, uh, in Bose-Einstein uh, condensates. There is um, the, the, the excited states, and once they're all populated, you have to put your additional particles into the ground state. And then you have you start forming the condensate. And the same happens here. You're um, putting in energy, and then this energy gets partly dissipated. It gets partly transported backwards. If you put in more energy, it gets transported further backwards until you hit the largest scale of your system. And then you start building up a huge portion of energy in the largest scale until the little bit of friction that you have in the largest scale uh, is enough to balance the amount of energy that you're dumping. And so this is how you get this, uh, how you can reach a balance between this condensate and this state up there. And so the question is, can you see this? And if you can see this in simulation, when might it happen in experiment? So we need a model. And uh, there is a bit of, there, there is not just sort of one model. It's not just sort of the Navier-Stokes equation by itself, but you have to somehow put in uh, the fact that there are bacteria driving it. And the model that we're using is motivated by the following observation. We want to replace the bacteria by some kind of driving force. And then we have uh, the usual uh, interactions in the flow. So we want to focus on the velocities. And so we take a Navier-Stokes type equation, and then we somehow have to model the forcing. And we do this with this effective viscosity type thing. And as usual, if the viscosity is positive, you get dissipation. And if the viscosity is negative, then in this representation, that would correspond to a forcing. Now, there was sort of a, uh, uh, a model um, using uh, a polynomial representation which we decided to map onto something that was piecewise constant because it allows us to focus things a little more. If you change a parameter here, you're changing both the driving and the width of the region that you're driving, whereas if you do this with a piecewise constant one, you have dissipation here, you have dissipation there, and then there is a small range of wave numbers in which you're forcing. And then you can run simulations. And this is the forcing rate compared to the dissipation. And if you have a little bit of forcing, you sort of get the state up here. If you add a little bit more of forcing, you go up here. And if you pass a threshold, you suddenly go way up in amplitude. Uh, this was scaled down by a factor of 20 to fit on this scale. So you're really building up this condensate. And you can actually see it in the velocity fields here. This is the part that is sort of the, um, the disordered case down here. Here, you begin to see a little bit more of a structure. But by the time you get up there, you have sort of this pair of big vortices that sit in the domain. Uh, so you really see this transition from uh, a normal bacterial turbulence to one with a condensate. Um, it turns out that this transition is subcritical. Uh, just two more slides. Uh, and if you now go through the numbers, then you get that there is sort of a critical Reynolds number uh, where this happens on the order of 10 to 20. And if you compare what you see in experiments, this would be uh, about 10 to the minus 2, a little bit more. And then there are various elements by which you can get um, this Reynolds number fast, uh, higher. Um, there is sort of a, a factor of 10 reduction by collective interaction. There is speculation that there is a zero viscosity state, which would be nice. And if you take sort of a different form of these uh, driving um, uh, elements by what is called a magnetic spinner, you actually get Reynolds number on the order of 30, which would be in that regime. That's the part that I'm going to chip, skip, and that was too fast. What I wanted to pull up was sort of the last slide. By way of summary, come on. There we are. 
So the, the three parts that I've talked about um, are uh, this question of if you have sort of these flagella and the mechanical instabilities, which good are they? Um, then this um, analysis of the heterogeneity in the bacterial swarms by an incredible set of movies that allow you to do this in very high resolution. Um, this question of the 2D inverse cascade, the theoretical model suggests that we're very close to uh, actually doing this also in experiments, but the experiment hasn't been done yet. And then the last part is the part that I had to skip. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for this presentation. So we have time for two, three questions. Is there any question? Please. Bruno, this the inverse cascade. It now seems sort of it's very compelling. What, what is the kind of exponents that you get over there? Um, the there is something like sort of an almost inertial range. So uh, the condensate drops off like k to the minus three. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just one wave number, but there is a range because right, of right. nonlinear interactions. Then you have a k to the minus 5 thirds until you reach the, uh, uh, the viscous range, and then it goes down, as usual, exponentially thereafter. There are different exponents. There are different exponents. Um, I have to say the part that I find more fascinating than the exponents <laughs> is this transition. How does it depend on the driving amplitude? And the way to model this is you say you know what the exponents are, and then you patch it together. Uh, these different elements with regions in between. And... Pablo, please. Thanks for your talk. So is it known with whether there is a critical population of bacteria to get to trigger an inverse cascade? So I, I guess if you have too little... Um, critical uh, uh, population... Let's put it this way. Um, things can get a little complicated. Now, the, the way you could uh, get higher Reynolds number is you make them swim faster. You take more of them. Um, uh, or you, uh, well, and that would, are sort of the main effects. Now, if you have more of them, they still have to live. So uh, keeping them happy is the main issue there. Um, the same is true if you go to the, the chemical ones like Janus type particles, you again have to provide enough fuel, and at some point you run out of it. Um, also, in order to form the inverse cascade, it takes a time. Yeah, because you're, you're starting on these small scale vortices, then you form these 100 micron type things, and then you have to add more and more energy to get sort of the longer ones, and that takes its time. And uh, in most experiments, this will be somewhat difficult to maintain. Uh, the other part, when you go to experiments, what you have to think about is you want to do away with friction with the glass plates. You really want sort of to get a freely suspended film. Because if you have that added friction, then this takes out the energy of the, of the condensate. and That's another thing to worry about. Um, the most important part of this is the critical Reynolds numbers were not really known. And so that this is on the order of 10 to 20 is sort of a useful observation to guide further experiments. Yeah. Uh, so uh, natural bacteria would be in flows, for instance. So you have some hydrodynamic motion in addition to what you have on, on your plates. Yeah. And uh, so how would, depending on your hydrodynamics, which is the embedding medium, uh, your patterns change? Well, you know, I mean, as long as they're just sort of happily propagating along, you do a Galilei transformation, you get rid of it. The moment this becomes heterogeneous because you have a shear or vortices or other stuff in there, that's a different matter. We haven't looked at that. Um, and, you know, this is when they start interacting. Now, this question about do they start forming these, these um, trigger these inverse cascades? I haven't really made up my mind whether the formation of this inverse cascade would be detrimental or beneficial to the bacteria. Now, it would be nice to have sort of a large gathering of them, but on the other hand, you know, I mean, you're again localized. And so to explore sort of the environment that is available to you in forming this inverse cascade and this condensate might not be the best thing to do. So I think that natural bacteria might have a natural tendency of not getting there. And if they did, evolution probably took care of it. So. 
Thank you, Bruno. Let's take, thank the speaker again. Ah, sorry. So, so okay. which is the next speaker? Ricardo Gutierrez, please. Can you hear me? Ah, you cannot see anything. Okay. Hmm. Is this connected then? Fine for a while, but just no, it's not. No, it's not. No, No, Okay, so I need the adapter. Do you know if we have an adapter? Yeah, I see one. Thank you, too. Yes. Okay, what is it? It's usually the old fashioned technology. It's more yeah. <laughs> Let's use this slide. Okay, so what is this? So for the next speakers, please take into account that the no? HDMI connector okay. has some technical okay. problems. So. Okay. Uh, Ricard, the next speaker is Ricardo Gutierrez from the Universidad Rey Juan Carlos in Madrid, who will talk about targeting the dynamics of ecological networks. Please, okay. Ricardo. Thank you, Maria. So, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this uh, very nice opportunity to speak here. In this talk, I will present some recent work, actually ongoing work, on targeting the dynamics of ecological networks. This is done in collaboration with Massimo Materazzi and Stefano Focardi, who are experts in ecology, actually, and with Stefano Boccaletti, who most of you know. And they are all working at the CNR in Florence. Okay, so first of all, let me explain what is the basic idea of targeting. Target is the first uh, word in the title, so I should explain that as you've heard many times, for example, in the talks yesterday on meteorology, in chaotic systems, small perturbations lead to large effects. And this is normally presented as a negative thing, like there's a lack of predictability. But this also means that sometimes a judiciously chosen perturbation can lead the system to an evolution. Um, with a very small size perturbation, you can have a large effect also for good, for your own benefit in some cases. And uh, building on this idea, there were two subfields of nonlinear dynamics that were developed in the 80s and 90s that were the uh, field of control. Americo spoke yesterday about control a little bit. So uh, the main idea, at least the original idea, was to stabilize and stable periodic orbits that are embedded in a chaotic attractor. And there's a related idea, which is that of targeting, which is uh, whose goal is to achieve a desired dynamics, sometimes it's called the goal dynamics, 
that is fully compatible with equations of motion. So you're not stabilizing anything that is not previously stable in the phase space. You're simply making the system forget its current initial, the conditional initial it started from and have a different evolution. Okay, so uh, this work started uh, some years ago during my PhD where we um, applied this targeting procedure to the study of complex networks of dynamical systems. So the motivation was to steer a given network of oscillators to a dynamics, and of course you have two ways to do that. One is to start at the right initial condition, which is for most purposes impracticable in, in most systems, and the idea of targeting is to perturb the network, to perturb different nodes of the network that are evolving in time according to some deterministic evolution, so as to make it forget its initial condition and have a different time evolution from that time onwards. Okay, so this was published, as I said, uh, during my PhD, this was 2012, and we reported a generic procedure and by generic, we meant that this could be applied in many different systems uh, to steer a network dynamics towards a desired evolution. Okay, so uh, if you look at the uh, papers that have cited this one uh, from 2012, every single one of them is a theoretical paper. It's on controllability of networks and related subjects. So it was always a bit uh, of a disappointment that no experimentalists or people dealing with technological networks were using this idea, which we thought was quite general and quite widely applicable, to uh, gain insight or to control their own systems, the systems they were studying. So that's why it was a great uh, opportunity to work uh, when Stefano told me that there were people in Florence that were interested in applying these ideas, which we hadn't worked on for the intervening years, uh, to, a, to a, an ecological network and to gain insight about the species that you have to control in order to have a desired evolution in an ecological network. Okay, so let me explain briefly what the targeting procedure is about. It's really quite simple. Um, so first, uh, what you want to do is to apply a sequence of perturbations. That means acting on different nodes of the network <coughs> until you, you get the dynamics you want in that network. But that, again, as I said, it's fully compatible with equations of motion. You that, just didn't start at the right initial condition. So in order to do that, you build a two-layer network. There is the original network, which you call the slave network, because it's the one that is going to be acted on, and there's a copy of it that you call the master network. Okay, and the master network is an identical copy of the slave network, only it started from the right initial condition. Okay, and you may say, well, you were saying this is applicable, and now you need two layers instead of one. What if you have a specific system, then you, you don't have another layer? So the good thing is that the master layer doesn't have to be another physically different uh, network. It can actually be a recording, an experimental recording, a time series of the activity of the network. It can be a simulation, it can be many things. It doesn't have to be like this. But in the, let's say, theoretical study, we treat them on equal footing, but this may be very different in nature, okay, in a specific situation. Actually, in the ecological networks, the slave network is the original one, and the master one is, this, for example, a recording of the, of the uh, populations of different species when the dynamics was good to your, according to what you want. So it would, when it was, for example, some species were within certain bounds, and then you can use that to target that dynamics and to force the actual network to follow the dynamics. Okay, so um, as I said, there are uh, different actions on different nodes. So this would be the master network. This would be a slave. It's an identical copy. And the idea is that you apply unidirectional links from master to slave. For example, in this case, you are pinning node number two. In the next step, you will pin node number three, and maybe then num number five. And after a sequence of unidirectional links, from the master to the slave, you finally will reach a synchronization between the two networks. Okay. And this is uh, your final goal, because that means that you have imposed here the dynamics that you want to have. Okay, so it's a sequence of master uh, slave in actions, and finally you have what you may call in the, uh, at that time I think multi-layer networks were, weren't even starting, but now you would call this interlayer synchronization, in the sense that you have two uh, networks that are identical and are synchronized to one another. Okay, uh, so the goal dynamics itself, the goal, uh, dynamics that you want to impose, does not need to be synchronous. This is an important thing because sometimes uh, this may sound confusing. So when I speak about synchronization, it means that two networks are synchronized to each other, but it doesn't mean that node one and two in a specific network are doing the same thing. It just means that node one is doing the same thing in the master network and in the slave network. Okay, so the idea, mathematically, you can write the equations of motion of every node, 
and this F would be the autonomous evolution of each node in a network, and then you have the usual diffusive coupling, which here is encoded in the uh, Laplacian matrix of the network, and this would be the equations of motion of the uh, nodes in the master network, and then you have similar equations in the slave network here, but you have an additional term, and this term is simply encoding the pinning actions from master to slave. Okay, so you have a here, here a kind of indicator function that is one if that node was pinned, another one is zero. Okay, so what we did was, okay, we can probably study the stability of interlayer synchronization and uh, apply that to some numerical simulations of, of networks and try to see how, um, how we can get, uh, what kind of information we get from the pinning um, actions that we apply. So we uh, linearized, so first of all, we created this vector, which is simply a concatenation of the state vectors of the different nodes in the network for the master slave, sorry, for the master layer and for the slave layer. And then we calculate the difference, and then uh, you can easily compute the equations of motion for the difference, and then to first order, you just apply linear stability. This is a bit, uh, may remind you of the master stability function uh, method of Recorda and Carroll. So once you have these variational equations, you have n uh, linear equations, which you can numerically integrate together with the um, equations of uh, motion of the master network, and from these you can get the Lyapunov spectra, the Lyapunov exponents of the dynamics, and we will focus just on the first uh, Lyapunov exponent because this is one. This one um, is telling you if it's ne if, when it becomes negative, it's telling you that um, master and slave are necessarily synchronized. Okay. And apart from this, we also use another observable of the dynamics to test when the two systems have synchronized, when the master has imposed this dynamic on the slave, and it's simply the synchronization error, which is, you know, simply this would be the Euclidean norm of this vector. So this is telling you, uh, when it reaches zero, it's telling you that the two, net, the two layers are synchronized. Okay, so uh, what is this pinning sequence I was saying? You, you apply a, um, a unidirectional action at uh, node one, then at five, then at 25. How are you doing that? So f initially both networks are uncoupled, and then you start pinning them according to some criteria that I will now explain. And then you get this, for example, you started with pinning node 12, so there's a unidirectional link from node 12 in the master layer to node 12 in the slave layer, then 31, then seven, and so on. And this gives you a sequence of nodes. Okay, and we'll try to understand how the sequence of nodes that you get from different strategies uh, how that is related to the topological properties, okay, to the position of those nodes in the network. So two important questions on how many nodes need to be pinned and what are the properties. Okay, so um, we applied three different strategies. Well, initially we thought about three different strategies. So first is the optimal sequence. The optimal sequence would be uh, what you get if you go through all possible sequences of nodes and you choose the one that brings you um, interlayer synchronization with the smallest number of steps, with the smallest number of perturbed nodes. Um, that would be very nice, but of course, the number of uh, sequences is n factorial, so it's quite large, for even for small networks. So then there's the other option, which is a sub suboptimal sequence. And this is, you basically apply a greedy algorithm that at each step, is choosing the node that is making the Lyapunov exponent, the maximum Lyapunov exponent, uh, making it decrease by, largest, by the largest amount. Okay, so you check all of them and you say, okay, if I pin here, I get the largest decrease in Lyapunov exponents, I get in faster to synchronization. Of course, it's suboptimal because you don't really know if there's a shortcut if you take another node that it maybe doesn't bring the largest decrease at that time, but if you combine it with the next step, it does. Okay, for that, you need really the optimal sequence. And then we also consider random sequence for the purpose of just comparing with a kind of no case that you know is not really good, but at least you can make a comparison between your choice and what you get if you have uh, absolutely no uh, criterion. Okay, so the optimal sequence, as I said, is discarded because, for example, if you take a network of 20 uh, nodes, you would need uh, 2 times 10 to the 18 uh, uh, different sequence to try. Okay. So, uh, what we did was to first look at small networks and to see what kind of ranking you get when you apply the suboptimal uh, criterion, the suboptimal method, to your networks. So in this uh, 2012 results, 
Uh, the networks were undirected, and the, we, try, we studied Russell oscillators that were linearly coupled. Okay, this is important. These two points are important because none of the ecological networks we're interested in now satisfy these two properties. Okay, so I will explain how that changes later. So we studied networks of 50 oscillators with a degree that was uniformly distributed between 5 and 45. And we also studied more common topologies. I will explain this later. But the interesting thing about this one is this samples all possible degrees, and you have all kinds of nodes in the network. OK, so what you get is what you can see here on the right. So this is maximum Lyapunov exponent as a function of targeting step. This means simply 0 means the two, the master and slave are completely disconnected. Then 1 means there's one node that has been pinned. Two, two nodes have been pinned. And finally here, most of them have been pinned. And the blue circles here are what you get for the suboptimal ranking. So here, you're choosing nodes that are giving you the largest uh, decrease in, Lyapunov expo in the maximum Lyapunov exponent. And you can, of course, this is just a targeting step. As I was saying, this is not the number of the node. You're just saying, I pinned one node, two nodes. But if you look at the nodes, you can check the properties. And what we did was look at all, all the usual observables in uh, networks, such as uh, the degree, different measures of centrality. And it so happens that the degree by itself gives the best explanation of what is going on. So if you look at the different nodes that have been pinned, so here is when you reach, when it becomes negative, you know it has reached uh, interlayer synchronization. So if you look at the, uh, this is the targeting step. This is also a targeting step, and this is the degree of the nodes that you are targeting. And what you see, this starts from the highest, high, most highly connected nodes, and it goes to, uh, to uh, nodes with lower connectivity until finally you uh, are targeting on the very peripheral nodes. OK, so the, uh, actually, if, if instead of applying the suboptimal procedure, you just use the degree ranking, you start by the high, most highly connected node and go on, then you get pretty much the same result. And the difference is that the computation of the suboptimal rankings requires this many uh, um, uh, calculations of Lyapunov's exponents for each different, uh, for all the steps, for all the different steps combined, whereas the degree ranking just requires n because of each step, you know which node you want to pin. So the computation is much more efficient, and this means that you can apply this procedure safely in larger networks where the suboptimal ranking would be extremely, uh, um, extremely difficult to to achieve. Okay, not to speak about the optimal ranking. So the same kind of correlations that you find here between the targeting sequence, the targeting ranking, and the degree ranking is found for uh, Erdos, Renyi, random graphs, and for scale-free networks as well. Okay, the only thing is that in that case, you don't have so much variability, so much different possibilities in the degree distribution, so you don't see it as nicely as here. Okay, so what we did is, now that we have uh, a strategy that is simple because you just have to follow the degree distribution. Let's do it with larger networks and see how things go. So what we did was to compare the uh, targeting of uh, Erdos, Rangian and scale-free networks with degree ranking, and here DEG means degree ranking, and with a random ranking, meaning you choose nodes at random. So this is the maximum level of exponent synchronization error. Essentially, they are giving you at the end similar information. So we can focus, for example, here on the synchronization error. So you start from these connected networks. You have this synchronization error. And then as you start applying the procedure, the targeting, then for the uh, scale-free network, you see that with a degree ranking, you achieve synchronization in about 19 or 20 steps, whereas using a, a random ranking, if you don't choose really the nodes that you're, that you're pinning, then you need 160, essentially. OK, so there's a large difference. And with those ranging networks, what you find is that also is much more efficient, of course, to follow the, the degree ranking than a random ranking, but the difference is less large. So we thought, okay, this is nice because there are so many networks that follow a power law in the degree distribution that this means that these networks are very easy. I mean, not very easy, but they are susceptible to, uh, uh, to be targeted with a small number of steps because of their heterogeneity. Okay, so uh, this, uh, we did this and a couple of things more. For example, we studied how the network uh, can be targeted in the abs when you have only incomplete information about the degrees, and the results were quite robust in the sense that sometimes you have only information on 40% of the nodes, and still you can target uh, a given dynamics in a short, uh, with a small number of steps. So the next thing was last year when uh, we started working on these ecological networks, and um, these people in Florence, Massimo Materazzi and Stefano Focardi, 
are uh, having working for many years on trophic web models. And these trophic web models are essentially ODE systems where each uh, uh, variable or each node, if you see it as a network, is the population of a species. And the links can represent many things, such as predation, competition, or scavenging. Okay, so you have uh, uh, different links between different species, depending on how, whether one is predating on the other or they're competing for food. And, uh, for example, this is uh, uh, some results they published uh, a couple of years ago on a northern Apennine model. And this is much more than the kind of uh, system we're studying now, but it gives you an illustration. Of, for example, here you may think, oh, these links are all unidirectional. But it's not so, because, for example, here, if you have predation from one species and another, that means that, uh, of course, this affects the, the growth rate, let's say, of the population of deer, but also of wolves. So the links, in, the sen in a sense, are, are uh, mixed, sometimes are unidirectional, sometimes are bidirectional, and they take very different functional forms. So the equations can be quite um, complicated. Okay, so um, what we are doing now is to study with them. So the, the motivation is uh, there's a certain ecosystem that we knew, knew for example, that for some time was um, evolving uh, within certain boundaries that were of interest to natural park managers or whoever. And now uh, we can try to apply a recording of that activity on, an, on a real network on controlling the species to make sure that, for example, you don't get extinction of a different species or that some other species doesn't grow without bound, etc. So the idea is how to do that. We are very far from that at the moment, but this would be the, the motivation. Okay, so uh, it's a network of 12 species that contains the most important uh, relationships between species in European and North American uh, ecosystems. So these are the species involved. And in order to apply it, uh, targeting as we've studied it, uh, the network evolves chaotically. Some of these networks do evolve chaotically, some of them don't. Uh, they have a periodic evolution. In this case, uh, there's a forcing term that causes the, the chaotic evolution, which is the periodic uh, acorn production. As these forces, uh, it's a kind of forcing on the carrying capacity of the wild boar, and this uh, propagates through the network and leads to a chaotic dynamics. Okay, so first, uh, in this case we have, undirect, uh, in the original paper, sorry, we had undirected links, uh, but in this case we have both undirected links and highly asymmetric links. They are not exactly directed, there's always some uh, feedback, let's say, but uh, they're generally uh, links of the two types. If you want to, to binarize them, so to say, you get some links that are directed and some that are undirected. And, uh, also, what you have is that the couplings between the different, so for example, this case is how, a kind, I think it's a fallow deer, how it evolves in time, and this is a predator, I think it's a wolf, and here you get the functional forms are slightly different. Here you have another coefficient, and then it multiplies by this. So you never get exactly the same, and here they have different signs, of course, because the predator is growing when it's more food, and this population is decreasing when it's being predated on. So... Uh, so you've got different kinds of links, and you go, you've got different uh, couplings that are, in general, nonlinear. This is, for example, different forms that these functions that give relationships between species can take. Um, and as I said, the original procedure only considered undirected networks of linear and coupled systems. So we need an extension that includes mixed networks and also nonlinear couplings. So what we did was first to study uh, the same... Uh, targeting procedure in a network of uh, Rossler oscillators to see if we could generalize this, this uh, method to the case of mixed networks containing both directional and undirection uh, directed and undirected links and with nonlinear couplings between the oscillators. And, okay, so in this case, uh, it turns out that when do you do this, you again consider, for example, a network of 50 oscillators, but in this case you've got both the in-degree and the out-degree, meaning the number of connections that go, of links that go into the node, and the number uh, of connections that go from it, okay, the, that come out of it. So uh, both are uniformly distributed because, again, we're also checking more standard topologies, but this is use, useful because it contains all different values of, of the in-degree and out-degree. So this is directed or undirected? Mixed. Mixed, yep. Random. Yep, it's random. Okay, so... Uh, so... What we did was, 
Okay, first we expect it. Maybe now it's something like in the case of undirected networks, only we need to compute, for example, the average of the in degree and the out degree. In degree plus out degree divided by two. And this is absolutely not the case. This doesn't give you any correlation with the suboptimal ranking that you get in this case. So if you start inspecting the kind of uh, uh, properties you have from the nodes that you're pinning when you apply the suboptimal procedure, in this case you see that most of the nodes, you start from the nodes that have a very small in degree and a very large out degree. This means those are the nodes in the network that are very easy to control because they have less uh, influence from the rest of the network, and at the same time, they can propagate the perturbation there to many nodes in the network. Okay, so what we found is that uh, after trying with several different observables you can get from the, from the adjacency matrix, uh, what uh, we found is that the uh, uh, out degree divided by the in degree is by far the best observable that gives a correlation with the, with the uh, suboptimal ranking. So for example, this is, this is the Lyapunov exponent function of the targeting step for networks of, uh, uh, direct, uh, uh, sorry, mixed networks of uh, nonlinearly coupled uh, Rossler oscillators. And this is the uh, synchronization error. Again, they are given similar information. So when you, this Lyapunov exponent becomes negative, you get to zero in the synchronization error. And if you plot the uh, K out divided by K in of the different uh, nodes that you're perturbing here in the suboptimal sequence, what you find is, in fact, that it follows very nicely uh, the K out divided by K in ranking as well. Okay, so the same correlation between suboptimal ranking and, and this observable, for which I don't have a name at the moment, is uh, you can also see with Erdos, Rangy, random graphs, or with scale-free networks. Okay, though again, you don't have so many different possibilities for those networks, so I show the case where you can see more clearly this. By the way, this is based on only um, 10 realizations or so. So you don't need many to really see that uh, what you're choosing is nodes in, uh, from the highest value of KL divided by K in to the smallest value. Okay, so we applied the same procedure to the uh, trophic web. So in this, uh, in this case, what I'm showing you, instead of giving you the uh, targeting steps, I'm giving you the names of, well, not the names, the names of the variables in the model that represent the different species. And here is the maximum open of exponent and the synchronization error as you target the, uh, the ecological model containing 12 species. And what you find is that you've got this uh, order. Uh, you start by controlling two types of deer. There are three of them, I think, in the in the uh, system, then the beaver, then the wolverine, then the lynx, and that's enough to control the network. Now I have to tell you something, and is that there's a free parameter always in the targeting procedure, which is the coupling strength between the two layers. So here, if you apply a smaller targeting step, uh, coupling strength, sorry, you may need more targeting steps to really reach synchronization between the two layers, but this, uh, this ranking seems to be quite robust in the sense that you change the, the coupling strength over a relatively large uh, interval, and you get very few changes from this, maybe these, these and these exchange positions. Okay, so it seems that with a small number of uh, species that are controlled, you could, in principle, achieve the dynamics that you want in your ecosystem. So uh, there's an open problem here that I don't know, we don't know how to uh, do at the moment, that is, uh, it's difficult to relate these results with the previous results with the Rossler oscillators because in this case it's not clear what is your K in or your K out because the different species are interacting with different functional forms. So how do you find, it's not even a weighted network, it's more complicated than that. Different links have uh, different mathematical forms, so what is, how do you compute that? So if anyone has any idea about this, I would be very happy to discuss it. And so just to finish, uh, the main conclusions from the work, the work is not yet published, as I said, it's, uh, it's an ongoing project, but we're reaching, uh, uh, we already have all the main results we, we, we think we need. So the, the targeting procedure allows one to impose a goal dynamics on a system in many different contexts. So this is ecological networks, but I believe that many different systems can be, um, can be targeted this way. For example, we are talking now with some people in Mexico about some optical applications where this could perhaps work as well. And um, the targeting ranking, the, what we call the suboptimal ranking, is correlated with different topological rankings depending on whether there are directed links or not. So it seems that when you have um, 
undirected links, basically correlation is with the degree distribution, with the degree ranking, sorry. And when there are directed links, there's this observable that gives you, again, how much, uh, how free a given node is to be perturbed because it doesn't have so much influence from the rest of the network and at the same time how good it is at propagating the perturbation to the other nodes in the network. And uh, in the case of ecological networks, the targeting procedure shows how by controlling a small number of species, in the case we showed before, four, four or five species, an ecosystem can be made to follow desired evolution. Okay, and what we're trying to do at the moment is to see if we can uh, get something like ideas from, uh, for example, you've got a movie where you have set a collection of time series where you have the population of different species where you could use that, do that uh, based on actual recordings like uh, Stefano Focardi and Massimo Materazzi have, Materazzi have on different ecosystems across Europe and to use that to force your model to reach uh, that desired evolution and to see how, which species you should choose in order to, to bring the system back to that desired dynamics that you recorded at some point. Okay, and with this, I would like to finish, so thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, thanks, Ricardo. So we have time enough for different questions. So is there any question there? Hilda. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I don't understand how you do how you do this procedure in, in, in the real world. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, while mathematically is all okay, but, but I mean, how do, you, how do you establish a certain target in the, in the real life, uh, and, and, that's exa and how do you do it? Because how, I mean, for instance, I want to give you probably one of your examples, mm -hmm. the case of the wolves in the Yellowstone Park. Mm -hmm. I mean, that they put back a few wolves and the whole thing almost went back to where it was. <laughs> so so they, there are lots of them now. Uh, so, I mean, they, can you tell me how to do it experimentally? That's yeah. what I would like to know. Yeah, in the case of ecological networks, for example, we, we are, yeah. Okay, so in that case, uh, as I said, you have the time series of uh, measurements of the activity of the, of the network, or you are simulating it. Okay, and then if you do it, well, there are two different ways to do it. One is to do a, to do a simulation with a good model and extract information from there, and then you, you know how you can control the population. Perhaps you can introduce more, uh, more deer, or you can reduce the population, as is sometimes done, if, in case it's considered to be dangerous. And so you have different ways to act on it, but I think the best first step would be to model it and to gain from that modeling the intuition of which pieces are most important to control in a given situation, okay? That's one way. So I don't know if uh, in the case of ecology, I think that's the only way to do it. In the case of uh, a given experiment where you have, for example, nonlinear circuits coupled or something like that, it's very obvious, right? You can, you can have, for example, an experimental recording of the activity of that uh, collection of circuits that are interacting with one another, and then you can use that to uh, perturb those circuits. So in the case you have uh, an experiment that, uh, of a reasonable size, let's say, where you, can, you have control over the elements, you can really apply the procedure as it is. In, uh, in the case of ecology, I think you would need to model things and gain insight from that and then apply it. Mm -hmm. Stefano. Uh, just a small comment on your question. Uh, in the case of the ecosystem, also, to define the question, that is, for example, in the, this is a, a way of uh, targeting a generic dynamics. In the case of ecosystem, usually you have a goal. For example, the wild boar population should not exceed the given threshold. Otherwise, the wild boar diffuses, they go to the field, and they destroy the field. So what you can do, you can register in the field the evolution of the wild boar and take the time windows in which that evolution was inside the desired. And then you put together these pieces of movies, like cutting movies in pieces and put together. So you, you, you generate a very strange dynamics, which is however compatible with, uh, with the system because it was produced by the system itself, and you use this as a master. So then you, 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 you are basically forcing your system and you're sure 
if you synchronize, that your wild boar population will never exceed what you want. That's just an example. Thank you, Stefano. Is there any other question? I have a small question. It's about the, the, a delayed system, because most of the ecological, I mean, food webs in real life, there is a small delay between the interaction between predator prey. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if your scheme, have you tried it on, no, to apply it to really. delayed systems? Not really. No. Uh, no, and I think the ecological models that we are using and or related ones never contain this, but I should think probably in that case, I don't see any good reason why it shouldn't work. But uh, I would have to think about it to, to really see the details. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again, Ricardo. I can thank the speaker. And now, the, the last speaker of the session, Ricardo Gidi de Carvalho. Ricardo will give us a talk about the transport barrier with uh, curves or attractors shearless. Ricardo comes from Paulo State University. Uh, okay, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity, especially Yuda Cerdeira. Thank you. And. Uh, I would like to, uh, to show you uh, some, uh, some results uh, about uh, transport barriers, which is a topic that has been already introduced by Ibere and also Ricardo Viana uh, in their uh, talks. Uh, initially, I would like to, to thank uh, San Piqui for a fellowship, CAPES for a, a scholar, a master of a scholarship, and FAPESP for general financial support. Okay. And uh, I, I will show, show you uh, two, uh, the two topics, essentially. Uh, the transport barriers in conservative uh, scenario and uh, transport, something like uh, uh, transport barrier in dissipative scenario. Okay. Uh, this is an overview of what I will show you. I will show you something about partial and uh, complete barriers, attractors. That uh, there are many many kinds of attractors, but I would like to show you a, a new kind of one. Uh, Hamiltonian maps. I, I will skip this. Uh, I will talk you about your resonance, uh, is isochronous resonance, which is. Uh, a kind of uh, resonances that uh, precede the, uh, the occurrence of uh, shearless. The, the model that I will use is called the labyrinthic map, the shearless curves, and the, the shearless attractor, which is a new kind of attractor, which is uh, related with this kind of uh, structure, and uh, collective transport barrier, okay? Essentially, we, have, we, we, we can have two kinds of barriers, uh, complete and partial. Complete barriers, we can, uh, uh, we can have something like this, robust tori, which uh, corresponds 
to invariant curves uh, of the imperturbable system. This means that this kind of uh, tori uh, survive to genetic uh, perturbations. And also Shirley's curves that uh, Ricardo Viana has already introduced yesterday, and uh, Iberê has called something about uh, in the, before yesterday. Shirley's curves uh, correspond to invariant curves, uh, which, uh, which correspond to periodic orbits with a local extremal frequency, okay? And uh, we can have also partial barriers, like, uh, like uh, such as leaky curves, or regions with strong stickiness. Cantor I, for instance, uh, corresponds to leaky barriers, okay? Any orbit in a region may pass through the gaps to another region. But uh, I, will, I will focus here, okay? Attractors, in general, we have uh, attractors of node dimension, point attractors, fossil and nodes, one dimensional, uh, limit cycles, it is very known. Surface shells, uh, two-dimensional. Chaotic attractors, and I will show you a new kind of attractors uh, called the shearless attractors. Attractor, which is uh, uh, whose uh, shearless curves, curve is the ancestral of the, the this kind of attractor, okay? Then, uh, initially, we have uh, introduced this map, which is very, very close to the non-twist uh, non uh, map. Uh, the, the main difference is that I introduced a second sign here. Yeah. Then here is a, a two-degree polynomial, okay? Where I, I, I only... Uh, I, I only wrote R1 and R2, R being the both uh, uh, roots of this polynomial. Usually it's y square minus one. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, yes, y square minus one. But I, I wrote so. Then this is very uh, common, but here I introduced this. And you look at here, the argument of the sign, I introduced this new parameter, parameter eta, which, mean, which play the, the, this role. The, this guy introduced bifurcations inside the islands, okay? Then this, is, this, this parameter uh, introduced chaos, uh, control chaos, as well as uh, A. But the, the, uh, uh, if B is not so strong, we have uh, resonance islands. And the, this parameter introduces bifurcation inside the, inside the islands, okay? And uh, this was initially introduced in this paper, uh, 2011. And this is only to show you what is the, the, the role of the parameter eta. For eta equals one, we have only one uh, one, uh, ah, sorry, sorry, let, let me go back here. Oops, oops. Oh, I would like to go back. Here. This is, this is an, uh, this term is a non-twist term, and uh, here we have a two-degree uh, two polynomial, and this means that uh, in, in, the, in the roots of this polynomial, we will appear uh, resonance in the phase space. Then, if you, we have uh, uh, three degree polynomials, it will appear three resonances, or the, the quantity you want to introduce depending on the degree of this polynomial. Then, in R1 and R2, we will occur two isochronous resonances. This is uh, what I called it before. Then the, 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 uh, the island chains are this one. Here, uh, okay, here uh, uh, is cut in one, but it is periodic, okay? Then we have here one resonance island chain, and here another one. But if, if, I, uh, if I choose it equal two, uh, it occurs a bifurcation inside this island and also inside this island. 
Here, there is an elliptic fixed point, or a, a stable equilibrium, which you will bifurcate in this way. And for x equal 0.5, it will occur a hyperbolic fixed point in two ellipticals. And the same here. If I choose at eta equal 3, uh, it will occur this. It is very small, but here there is there is also an elliptic fixed point here and here. The same here and here. Okay, this is the, the continuation of this. Then this means that uh, we have three pairs of uh, equilibrium points in, in each island. And for it equal four, the same. Another bifurcation inside the, the island with four pairs of uh, elliptic and hyperbolic fixed points. The same in the other island. Then, how I'm showing here. The fact of the, 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 this parameter, which is in the argument of the sign, the second sign, OK? And why this is important? Because when uh, we induce this kind of uh, bifurcations, it will uh, prepare a scenario to occur uh, shearless curves. Okay, this is the point. And I will show you here uh, what is the shearless curve. Uh, I fixed here uh, eta equal 3. And here is the wind number calculated by this equation here. Uh, I fix uh, x0 uh, as 0.5. And x is the interaction of the map. The map okay? Then uh, when uh, we have only one ex extremum, in this case a maximum, we, we, uh, I pick the value of y, and uh, x is 0.5, and I can draw the, the curve here. Uh, I put uh, uh, a few curves, but uh, pinky curves, but one of them corresponds to the uh, maximum, okay? which is the shearless curve. But uh, we can have two. Uh, varying a parameter, we can have uh, uh, another kind of uh, shearless curve here, the same, it is here. But uh, the parameter induced uh, uh, um, reconnection of the islands. If you look at here, this manifold, which starts off this hyperbolic uh, point, which come here, now, it comes here, it comes here, okay? Then it's a reconnection of the, 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 the resonance. Now I, I change it a little, a little bit more the, the, the parameter, and we have two extremum, then two regions with shearless curves, and now three, okay? Uh, oops. Okay. Uh, here, uh, let me see. Okay, here it is a similar plot, but uh, uh, I, 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 show, I will show you uh, uh, a, a different scenario now. Here is the wind number with only one external, and this corresponds to the shearless curve, which is here in this, in this phase space. Okay. Now, I change the parameter and I introduce chaos in the system. Look at the difference between uh, this plot and O. This plot. It is the, the same if phase space. And here is the, the shearless curve uh, separating two regions, but there are a lot of uh, invariant structures here. Now, I, I increased the, the parameter that introduced chaos, and uh, all initial condition, conditions that I, I give in the red region, they never come to the black region and vice versa, because in the between, there is the shearless curve. But look at the, here that the shearless curve isn't anymore a smooth curve. It, it, it has this, this fashion. Okay, but it, it is survived to the, uh, the perturbation. Then this plot shows that the shearless curve, curves 
is a, a very, very uh, special curve because it's, uh, it uh, supports and it, it survives to very strong uh, perturbation. And the reason to that is because it, it uh, uh, windy number is very close to the, to the golden mean uh, number, okay? Then uh, the, the, the question that uh, we have posed here is the following. If, uh, as we know that the shearless curve is a very strong and robust curve, uh, uh, what will occur if we introduce dissipation in, the, in this system? And what will occur uh, with this special curve? And we did this here in this uh, work. The map is the same, but I introduced uh, dissipation in this way. And gamma uh, is a, a new parameter that if gamma is zero, we recover the the, the original uh, uh, scenario, but if for gamma different of one, uh, of zero, sorry, uh, we will have uh, dissipation in the system. Now, let's see what, what happens. Here in, in these plots, uh, I, I paid attention only for the shearless curves. There, there are structures. We, we, we could plot another structures, another uh, transients, here, there is something which is uh, transient. But I, I, I would like to see uh, only uh, the shearless curve. Then here is for a value of a parameter, another one. But if you look, oh, sorry. It's not going back. If we look here for, for, this, uh, for, uh, for, for this phase space, we have here uh, an elliptic fixed point, another one here, another one here, another one here. And the elliptic fixed point, when we introduce dissipation, they will be uh, attractor. They, they will be uh, uh, fossil, okay? Uh, attractive, each one will be an attractive focus. Here, here, here. Then we, we can have a, a lot of uh, point attractors. Besides here, okay? Inside, in, in, in any island, we also have elliptic fixed point, which will be uh, attractor. But uh, these attractors will, will be destroyed with the dissipation. But this, no. Then is what I would like to show you here. Here, uh, here, one, two, three, and four. Uh, eight, the, uh, the phase spaces, uh, one. Uh, one periodic, okay, but uh, I, I only extended it to two. Then uh, there are four point attractors and this curve. I, I gave a, a, a grid of initial conditions and uh, I, I disregard a, a transient and the result is this, okay? But uh, if I change the, the, the parameter a little more, the, the B, we can we can get something like this. And an amplification of this region show something weird here. Then, and changing a little more the, the, the B parameter, we have this. Then, what this plot or these plots are showing us? Uh, these, these, these plots are uh, related to this one, okay? This one is a conservative scenario and we have chaos and structures here. But after introducing uh, dissipation, uh, we have this. Then I, I gave a, a grid of initial conditions, and the uh, elliptic fixed points became attractors, point attractors, and there are this curve. This curve is uh, the corresponding attractor, uh, is an attractor, uh, which correspond to the shearless curves. Then this, uh, this curve survived to dissipation and it attracted the initial conditions because all the initial conditions uh, uh, have been uh, driven to, uh, to the point attractors and also for this guy. Then this plot shows us that the shearless curves uh, survived to the, to the dissipation and more. It became an attractor. 
Okay? Then is what I call uh, a new kind of attractor, is, and because uh, uh, his ancestor is the shearless curve, I, I, uh, I called a, a shearless attractor, okay? This uh, is a projection of the Lyapunov exponent only for the shearless attractor. We, we, we picked the uh, in, uh, initial conditions on, oops, oops, on the shearly attractor, and uh, uh, sorry, here is for the conservative case. Is the for the shearly curve? Uh, here, no, 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 show, sure. no, no, gamma, gamma. For the shearly uh, attractor, uh, and uh, this uh, is the. Uh, parameter space in V and the dissipation uh, parameter. And we have uh, the projection of the Lyapunov exponent only for the shearless attractor. It, what is showing us that it, uh, depending on the pair of the of V and gamma, the Lyapunov exponent can be positive or uh, negative. The, the scale is here, okay? Positive or negative, what it means that the shearless attractor can be regular or chaotic. This is what explain or give us something about this weird behavior here. Okay. Uh, but okay, I will skip this. Now, in, in a very, very recent work of February, what we have done here? We, we used the same, the same map with the, the same structures here, and we posed the following, following question. Okay, if uh, we have, uh, as in the conservative case, a scenario with, uh, with three shearless curves, because the winding number uh, presented three maximum, then it is possible to have uh, several, several uh, uh, shearless curves, and also probably several uh, shearless attractors in the same, uh, same phase space, okay? And this is, was the, the question that we have posed here. Then, here uh, I will show you the following. Uh, without dissipation and keeping uh, uh, one, one extreme in the winding, winding number, showing the shearless curve here. And uh, I disregard the, the, the dynamical structures, resonances uh, and uh, elliptic fi fixed points. I, I only uh, show you here uh, the, the neighborhood of the shearless attractor, which is the red curve. I changed a little bit the parameter, and I, the, the windy number presented a second uh, extremum here. And I, I draw, I have drawn here both shearless attractors. And now with three. Then we, ha we, we can have with this map, with this model, we can introduce as many as uh, shearless attractor we want. And for the, the point of view of uh, transport by her, this can be interesting because it, it is, it, for me, it is intuitive that uh, 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 a set of transport bearers must be better than one. Then we, we can model some, some kind of phenomena introducing um, many uh, many uh, shearless attractors. Then this is what I call a collective transport barrier, but in, in the conservative case. Then we, we pose the, the question, okay, the, 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 we know this, and if we introduce dissipation, what will occur with this scenario and with this collective uh, transport barrier, okay? Then what we see is this. Here, uh, gamma is the dissipation parameter, okay? Uh, uh, a, B, C, D correspond to these values. Here, uh, for this value, we have three, uh, three shearless attractor. The, the shearless curves that we have seen in the, uh, in the, previ in the previous uh, slide, 
now became three attractors. And I changed a little bit the, uh, the dissipation parameter. The attractors are going, uh, are, uh, are going, uh, to, to, uh, uh, yes, they're going in, in the, the direction of the red attractor, we can see here, and now here they have collapsed it into only one attractor. Then, if, if we have uh, the inverse process, suppose you have this. Oh, okay, I am studying a, a problem that it, it presents a shearless attractor. Okay, but how do you know that it, there is only one? You can break the degeneracy of this guy and reproduce this, changing the parameter in the inverse uh, sense, okay? Then I am showing here that, that one shearless attractor can be, uh, can be formed by uh, uh, many others. If you change a parameter, you can break the degeneracy of this guy and you have this, this. And now you, you can you can model a system or you can produce a, a, a scenario with uh, you know, a set of a shearless attractor. Okay, then th this is the, the, the main point, is, this is the goal that, uh, of the, this, this work that I, I am showing here, that we, we can have a collective uh, transport barriers and also we can have a collective uh, uh, a region, uh, region with a collective set, uh, a set of uh, uh, shearless attractor, which, if, uh, uh, which could be degenerated in only one, depending on the scenario that you, you start. Okay? Then, uh, essentially, uh, these are the, the results that I would like to show you. And, and here the, the conclusions uh, are essentially what I have uh, shown uh, show, show you. I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Th thanks, Ricardo. Is there any question? The audience? Yes. So when you introduce dissipation and all these uh, elliptic points get into attractors and also your shearless curve, then you should also have basins of attraction for each of those. So how would they look like? Uh, so these basins of attractions, have you studied them? And how would they change when you have these bifurcations of the, that you have several shearless attractors? I, I, I don't know if you, I... Uh, this is be before the end, <laughs> because <laughs> this is the, the following. Uh, here is the basin, basin of attraction of the, the elliptic fixed point, and I, I put, I put, here I put the, the following question. Uh, uh, I, I gave uh, a grid of initial conditions, and uh, I, I asked if the initial conditions go to the fixed uh, attractor. And the, the, ones, the, the initial conditions that uh, did, didn't go to any fixed attractor, I, I put the yellow color, and this corresponded to the uh, basing of attraction of the shearless curve. Okay? I don't know if this is the point that you uh, are you asking me, but uh, 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 the, the shearless attractor uh, dominates the, the, the region of attraction in the phase space. Then, surely, there are some things you are covering in the neighborhood of any point attractors, but the shearless attractor is very, very strong, and the, the most strong, uh, the strongest attractor of the phase space. I don't know if it was this point. Yes, Ilan. Very short question. The, uh, your your shearless attractor that you showed us that it have changed by changing parameters uh, has a, some regions so where it's chaotic. The attractor uh, here, 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 that one, and that one, 
<laughs> that one. I mean, what I want to know is when you, in those regions that they look fractal, I mean, uh, the transport is still uh, blocked. That's what I want to know by the attractor. Or, or do they have regions in their spares where, where transport is possible? No, no. Tra transport is not possible because the, the attractor will attract, okay? <laughs> then any initial conditions that you, you give below yeah. will be attracted, attracted by the shearless curve going to the bottom, uh, to the shearless attractor. And, and, and the initial condition that you give above will collapse the, in the attractor. Okay, but uh, there, there is something here that if you, here I, I plotted uh, uh, in the transient, there are something here, which is the transient before uh, collapsing to the, the attractor, the shearless attractor. Maybe, uh, depending on the parameters, uh, you can have also very small attractors here. But uh, the basin of attractions of these attractors will be very, very small. Then the, the most of the initial conditions will be attractive for the, uh, for the shearless curve, and it will be a, a, a barrier because uh, the initial condition that you, you start here never will be here because everyone will be attracted to, to the shearless attractor. Okay. Then it will continue being a barrier. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Okay. I think thank you. Thank again all the speakers. Now I think is the most expected moment, the break, coffee break. Esse não desliga, né? Oh, okay. Don't you need to turn off this? Oh, okay, okay. It's for the camera. Yes, yes. And I'm going to turn off only for economize the